Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 245 at block height 658,212 on Sunday, November 22nd. So, what is up, Janine? Not much, just enjoying the darkness. <laughs> so, if President Biden takes office, do you think that he should give Trump a presidential pardon for being a giant meanie? Uh, uh, we sh- so, did your connection just drop because you broke up for me when you talked? Uh, no, I think you cut out for a second. Damn, you lag, okay. ruining my cheeky snark. Well, I think I think that's a, that's a dead flop of a joke. It's the very start of the show. Okay, I've closed a few things, so hopefully it doesn't do that again. But yes, the darkness that I was talking about was the actual physical darkness and also the political darkness. I I just can't get it. Somebody published in CNBC um, an opinion piece on why Biden should pardon Trump when he takes office. And I just I can't get out of my head um, for what? Like, what has he been convicted of here that he needs to be pardoned for? Like, what? Well, um, if you haven't noticed, America is very resistant to ever charging their presidents with anything. Uh, So the fact that there are no charges is not really indicative of innocence, I would say. Um, But... Whether he pardons him or not, you know, that's just, that's the way things are. You know, you have that much power, you're basically invincible. So I, it would not surprise me. Um, I feel like, you know, every president, I, I mean, I've never seen a president that's deserved it. So I'm obviously opposed to it, but what can you do? <laughs> These people are going to do what they're going to do. But it's like he, he needs to be like convicted of something to be pardoned like i mean like obviously like i I don't want to drag this out too long i was just trying to make a cheeky joke at the start but like the first thing i did when i saw that thread was just start scrolling through the replies obviously um and yeah there's people screaming like don't you dare pardon him he has to pay for like insulting corrupt military officials or because of the people who died of coronavirus and it's just like none of those things are crimes <laughs> like you can't you can't go to jail for those things <laughs> so it's just i don't know it, it boggles my mind like how disconnected from reality shit is getting that some narrative like that is being pushed like you got to charge him and convict him of something first. <laughs> um, I mean, I can think of something. Uh, right at the beginning of his presidency, um, he authorized SEAL Team 6 to kill uh, Noir, an 8-year-old girl um, who happened to be the sister of a 16-year-old Denver-born American citizen who was also killed by drone um, many years ago with no trial whatsoever and not even actually being accused of doing anything himself just unfortunately was the son of a person who was also never tried and was accused of various things um so i guess i could put that there you know murdering an eight-year-old girl in cold blood yeah but then wouldn't we kind of have to you know go after obama for doing pretty much an almost identical thing yeah 
let's do it. Uh, I don't think it'll happen, but, <laughs> but I am totally on board with convicting every single still living president who has ever engaged in such behavior. All of them. Here, here. I don't know, though, in, in lieu of not creating another show that's half politics at the beginning and the end, uh, any other silly things you've seen going on this week before we dive into it? Um, no, not quite. Uh, there was, I believe, wasn't there a VR event that happened like yesterday or something? I sadly, um slept through that if we are thinking of the same thing because i got very drunk yeah you need to stop doing that <laughs> don't you tell like, me what to do today don't you tell me how much to drink or not drink i'm Irish. you can tell me how much to not drink shinobi because <laughs> because you're not irish um actually mm, well debatable but that's another story well, if you're Irish, then you have to drink. No. Sorry, I didn't make the rules, Jeannie. Oh, I have something. Oh, I, I mean, I mean, mostly you have covered this, but the stuff with, you know, micro strategy, um, buying up a lot of Bitcoin and Michael Sayer becoming like an instant celebrity um, who is like now the new Oracle thought influencer of Bitcoin. Yeah, I found that to be pretty awkward um, ever since it started. It's like, guys, it's just a guy with a lot of money who runs a company, he bought a lot of Bitcoin that does not make him a superhero. Like, you know, good for him being another rich person who has a lot of Bitcoin. Commendable. Um, and yeah, since then, um, he's made some questionable comments about Bitcoin, like how it's some kind of interest bearing financial instrument uh and other things like oh we should leave the currency part to the government bitcoin isn't a currency um yeah i mean this is what happens when you turn people into celebrities just because they have money don't do that because if you do you will be disappointed by uh the fact that they don't actually know very much about the technicals of the system surprise um, having money does not mean you're smart. Well, in, in fairness, I think that with the um, Bitcoin is not a currency thing, I do believe in a few interviews he's clarified that he means for now, like not necessarily in the absolute sense. But um, yeah, I, I'm just going to throw this to the front of the show. Um, I had it at the end of the news desk, but there's not really much there anyway. And you touched on the topic. But um, Sailor has recently made some comments about um, actually moving micro strategy into the space in terms of Bitcoin related um, services. <clears throat> and um, they're a, they're oh, a business. I hate this. Yeah, they're a business analytics company. So whether that is targeted towards market data or de-anonymizing people um, is kind of besides the point. Um, they're an analytics company. Um, and a direct quote from him is, there is an entire exploding universe of intelligence opportunities all wrapped around this kind of unique Bitcoin intelligence coming off the blockchain. And we'll explore it all. <clears throat> and so... Uh... Like, I, I do want to kind of drive home that they are a business analytics company. Um, so there are many, many things they could apply that type of tooling to um, in terms of chain data that isn't necessarily just trying to dox people, um, just looking at market analysis, market data, and things like that. But um, I, I see absolutely zero universes where they get into that and do not eventually start shifting towards more conventional chain analysis services as we know them to. I mean, I, I just don't see that. Yeah, I mean, as far as I know, the only, like, there are very few businesses doing blockchain analysis that are not doing it with either the primary purpose or at least the majority purpose being to help law enforcement 
Um, the only ones who are not doing that are the ones that actually share the analytics software with the public where you can also use it yourself. And it's not a secret. They're not trying to hide it. They're not trying to, you know, sell it to specific clients. They're sharing it with everyone. Those are the exception. Um, pretty much the only exception for the most part. Um, the rest are all trying to cater to law enforcement. So no, none of this none of this surprises me whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, yeah. Um, clap, clap, clap. I mean, don't get me wrong. I am happy that people with that level of wealth um, are starting to get involved in this space because, um, hey, that's going to make me wealthier. But like, it boggles my mind how many people just do not grasp in their head the other implications of people like this coming into the space. They don't care about your anonymous transactability on the internet. They don't care. All they care about is the asset, the monetary asset. And think twice about whether it's going to be a net positive or negative for people like this rushing into the space um, in terms of how much we can actually build to make how we want to use Bitcoin possible before all this liquidity steam rolls in here and stagnates everything. But anyway, we should uh, probably get into the stories. Mm-hmm. So um, Poolin, the mining pool, um, has set up taprootactivation.com. And yeah, this is really weird. Um, so Poolin, slush pool, btc.com. Remember, they are associated with Bitmain. F2 pool, ant pool themselves, and Luxor, a pool I've never heard of, um, all um, with different preferences of activation mechanism are voicing their support for taproot activation. And they have this whole website um, set up with a simple explanation um, of taproot as well as soft forked activation period. And this is just mining pools pushing to activate taproot. I mean, like, holy shit. We have spent the last, like, three years in 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 ptsd mode because of miners fucking with things during segwit activation um thinking of all these convoluted new activation mechanisms um that remove any influence from miners or ability to stall an upgrade and then the, the next major consensus change that rolls around it's the fucking miners that are like the, the first group going, let's do it. Come on, let's gauge support. Let's get it turned on. Let's do it. I mean, what the fuck? Like, I really cannot look at this and have it completely solidified in my mind that the entire reason behind the 2017 shenanigans was all Bitmain, was all Bitmain threatening to cut miners off from equipment if they didn't stand the line with him. And it was all about ASIC boost. That's it. That was literally the entire story. Um, there was no material factor there in terms of miners being hesitant beyond that. And like, yeah, here you go. The next thing, when there is no secret hack or optimization that Bitmain's cheekily using in the shadows, um, even even Bitmain's like, let's turn it on. Let's do it. Sounds about right. I mean, like, I don't care. Like, at this point, if if this keeps dominoing and other pools get on board, fuck it. Push a BIP9 activation. Like, just, just fucking do it. <laughs> like, worst case, um, if this is some super, like, fake out fuckery, then just drop a BIP148 style um, client that would force them to comply and get businesses to do that. But like, if if the miners get on board, like, fuck it, just just drop it. Let, let's get going. In before the core devs try to sneak in a scaling debate because they don't feel like the code's ready yet. <laughs> 
I mean, I don't see how it's not like it is a relatively pretty small change and has been autistically fussed over for so long at this point. Like, let's let's go. Come on. Let's clear this. Let's get it done. So app developers and protocol developers can start building with this shit and core devs can start looking at um, things like L2. But yeah. That weird twist of fate aside, um, what's going on in the Netherlands? Well, um, given that I'm not in the Nether Netherlands and uh, my uh, encounters with uh, Dutch uh, businesses or banks has been a bit weird because uh, the Netherlands is very strict when it comes to who is allowed to use their banks, apparently. And uh, so Bitonic, a Netherlands-based cryptocurrency exchange, announced that they had added an additional verification measure, measure regarding Bitcoin addresses in response to new screening requirements imposed by the Dutch Central Bank, or DNB, under their Sanctions Act, um, which this is going to be in my newsletter, so if you want to see what that uh, looks like, you can find that there. Um, but in their posts, they say, from now on, we are required to ask additional details such as the purpose with which you intend to purchase Bitcoins and what kind of wallet you use. Furthermore, we are obligated to verify that you are the legitimate owner of the given Bitcoin address by requesting you to upload a screenshot from your wallet or by signing a message. We understand that these additional measures cause... Uh, nuisance for our customers and we do not agree with the measure ourselves therefore we offer the opportunity to formally object to these additional measures and the registration of this data we will soon release a custom form intended specifically for this purpose for the time being you are invited to send complaints to privacy at bitonic.nl um on the same day, actually, the DNB also announced that the deadline for crypto service providers to register under the European Anti-Money Laundering Directives was November 21st, so two days ago. Um, what was a bit confusing to me, and I, I still kind of have to figure this out, is that the English, uh, they actually have an English version, um, the DNB does, for their news bulletins. And so the English version of the news bulletin said, um, basically, they they used both the fourth and the fifth directives, the AML directives, in their uh, in the bulletin. Um, so they would say like the fourth anti money laundering directive, and then they would use the um, acronym AML D five, which is the fifth one, not the fourth one. The Dutch version cites only the fourth, so I'm a bit confused as to which one they're actually complying with. Um, the Botanic post says it's the fifth, so I'm going to assume that it's probably the fifth. But Jesus Christ, uh, Central Bank, you need to um, you need to fix your posts and not confuse people with basic stuff like that because a lot of there's got there's going to be a lot more English speaking people reading these things than probably Dutch people. But anyway, um, Botonic has uh, notified customers that their registration under AML D5 um, has been completed, though they have mixed feelings about the new legislation. On the other hand, we are concerned about proportionality, the criminalization of the industry, and especially the privacy of our customers. We see that European legislation has been introduced in other European countries with a greater understanding of the market and technology. Of all those countries, the Netherlands appears to face the most extreme demands, and we are very disappointed by this. Um, so if anyone's not familiar with Europe, um, this is a European directive that was accepted by the European Parliament, but obviously um, with directives, each member state is able to kind of decide. They have some leeway about how they actually comply with it um, and like integrate it into their own laws. And so basically they're saying here that the way that the Netherlands has kind of formatted its own national policies uh, around complying with AML D5 are more strict than other countries. Um, and journalist Aaron Van Verdum, uh, who is Dutch himself, he actually received a response. Uh, this is quite funny because like imagine, you know, you're tweeting, you're shit posting about your central bank. Like if you're in the U.S. and you're an American, imagine you're shit posting about, um, I don't know, the Federal Reserve, and then you get a response from the Federal Reserve Twitter account. Um, that's basically what happened here. Uh, but 
uh, Aaron received a response from the DNB, and they said that they do not impose um, what specific procedure for verification these services must use. And then they linked to a list of suggested methods, um, but they are correct as far as their post seems to say. They don't say specifically what exchanges have to do or custodial services have to do in order to comply. They just give suggested methods. One of them, and, and you know, uh, I mean, they are correct. They don't impose a specific method, but their suggested methods are still eh. Like one of them is screen sharing or video conferencing at the time of logging in. So they literally, one of their suggestions is that when your customer logs in, they screen share their screen with you to, I guess, I don't know, show them logging in, which may involve sharing their password if it's not obscured, and then showing the contents of their account and wallet or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, then there's also a Swiss developer, um, David, um, who I've met a few times. He goes to Lightning conferences, uh, pointed out that the guidance from the um, uh, Financial Market Supervisory Authority in Switzerland, uh, FINMA, um, had based their uh, guidance on the Financial Action Task Force recommendations from June 2019, and their, I guess, implementation is similar to this. Um, one second while I scroll. Um, there was, I think, uh, some indirect commentary on this. Like, I don't think it's directly related, but with all of the changes happening to the travel rule and such, um, there was an interesting guest post by a former U.S. Justice Department chief of asset forfeiture and money laundering um, in Coin Center's blog. And um, I had actually not seen this acronym before, but uh, he said they effectively established KYCC, Know Your Customer's Customer or Counterparty, requirements that have traditionally been resisted by financial regulators for good reason. Unlike KYC requirements, which arise from a direct customer relationship, KYCC requirements unreasonably obligate non-customers to provide personally identifying information to a VASP slash money services business they do not know or do business with and whose security and privacy policies they have not evaluated simply because they happen to transact with one of its customers. Collecting identifying information from individuals who are not customers would also prove challenging for VASPs and likely only limit access to legitimate customers, particularly those from financially disadvantaged communities who stand to bene benefit most from this technology, since illicit actors would simply employ so-called money mules or use stolen or synthetic identities to defeat the requirement, just as they do with respect to KYC requirements today. The result would be to further exclude financially marginalized populations and hinder innovation which could serve their needs without meaningfully affecting illicit financial activity. Uh, so that was quite interesting, um, given that it's from a DOJ or former DOJ guy. Um, and now we have a new acronym, KYCC, another thing to hate. Uh, and there was, since then, there's been a small update, which is that on the 19th, when Bitonic said that they um, they had been registered um, under the AMLD5 requirements, uh, they are also, um, or they, they stated that they consider the whitelisting and verification of Bitcoin addresses to be illegitimate, disproportionate, and ineffective. It provides a false sense of security, and we have implemented the measures under protest. We will put our objections on this issue. Eh, issue. I'm having trouble speaking today. We will put our objections on this issue forward for evaluation by an independent judge so that a proper assessment of its legality and proportionality will be obtained to be continued. So apparently they are going to... I mean, they kind of indicated that in a prior post that they were going to fight the central bank on this they they actually tried to fight them before registering and that didn't work so i guess they're going to continue fighting it after this yeah getting a little bit excessive with the uh probing finger yeah what 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 had we said before multiple times in a prior issue finger up the ass <laughs> finger straight up the ass 
Well, I guess uh... there's there's all you know. There's that saying about um, Dutch people being so direct. <laughs> yeah, but I guess uh, I want to get into a parallel thing across the pond that actually could wind up being positive in some ways. Alrighty then. Um, yeah, so the comptroller um, has proposed um, some new rules to guarantee fair access to financial services. Um, and the, the actual proposal is pretty short and sweet, but some of the, the reasoning um, given for this is pretty interesting, actually. Um, they're specifically kind of looking at the fallout and dynamic of the, the kind of shit that was going on with Operation Choke Point, um, where you effectively had businesses refusing to offer services to people who were doing things that are completely legal, um, but just frowned upon or potentially higher risk activities. And um, yeah. So some of the specific examples um, that they bring up and don't bring up, I think, kind of illustrate the ultimate reason for this. But I still think this could wind up having a positive effect. So one thing you won't hear mentioned is things like um, cam girls or sex workers. What you do see mentioned is things like independent ATM operators, um, oil and gas companies, um, even firearms companies. And pretty much under, under the Dodd-Frank Act and how that was all established, um, it is illegal for banks to just at a broad scale refuse to engage with a whole industry. Um, unless they are literally unprepared um, from a risk assessment point of view to deal with that whole industry. And a lot of these industries, um, they are very well equipped for that. Um, but they're, they're kind of looking back at a, a huge pattern of any kind of financial service trying to bank with a larger bank um, being discriminated against in this way. Um, the same thing with firearms manufacturers. And the biggest issue they bring up is how a lot of banks have cut off um, financing for Arctic oil drilling and exploration. And the reason they give for why it's problematic that banks do this is this kind of thing is in the case of um, Arctic oil operations, um, the banks did not even themselves cite um, any kind of risk issue or compliance cost or anything. Um, they just literally said it's because we don't want increasing carbon emissions. So these banks effectively... Um, I'm betting from the comptroller's point of view and a lot of the government's point of view are kind of stepping into um, this should be the government's job to make these decisions. What the fuck are you doing? And specifically bring up how there could potentially be um, national security consequences of that type of just wholesale walling off, um, you know, entire industries from access to financial services. Um, importantly, notice how all the examples are big institutions, big markets, um, large corporations. They're not really talking about the, the cam girl who can't find a bank anywhere or, or the, the individual dealing with these types of problems. Um, it's the big entities. But effectively, what they want to do is establish a threshold um, after which you are considered the largest um, class of bank in the country and effectively set a threshold of $100 billion or more in total assets under management. Um, and they're also considering um, factoring in um, percentage of market share 
in the market for any specific financial services as another trigger for when this would be a, applicable. But um, you pretty much if you pass any of these thresholds or meet these conditions, um, you are explicitly not allowed to um, raise the price a person has to pay to obtain an offered financial service from the bank or a competitor through indirect um, dynamics there, or to significantly impede a person or a person's business activities in favor of or advantage to another person. Um, so hey, a bank that runs ATMs um, refused to bank a small ATM owner. Um, and pretty much is giving the comptroller, if this were to actually be enacted, um, actual enforcement authority against banks that do this. And effectively, or no, I'm sorry. Um, wow, brain fart. Um, I said they're not allowed to do those things. Um, raising prices or significantly impede um those are conditions for being a large institution um yeah long night last night um so yeah if you are able to do that um raise prices um directly or indirectly or impede a person's activities by refusing them um as well as the the thresholds in monetary terms um you are a bank subject to these kinds of restrictions um which would be um, you pretty much have to predetermine an objective risk assessment um, procedure, uh, apply that on an individual by individual basis. Um, and if through that alone, um, you know, that there is no argument for denying service to this person, then price their risk accordingly and offer them the service. And effectively giving the comptroller um, the authority to actually enforce and, and impose penalties on large institutions that meet these classifications um, and who are found to be denying services on any other basis than a predefined risk assessment. Um, and so, like, yeah, they, they're pretty much... Um, if this were to be enacted, um, going anybody who is wholesale um, refusing to bank entire markets or types of services, um, the government is going to come in and start doing the same thing um, when they catch you money laundering. And <clears throat> it really comes down to, um, you know, is this just going to be another way to extract money from banks? Or is this actually going to be applied in a way and widely enough to discourage this type of activity overall because you know crypto companies are a, a big market that is traditionally dealt with this problem a lot so aside from all the the wider ways this could be a net positive for people in society like specifically this would remove a lot of friction that crypto businesses in the u.s have to deal with so yeah, I, I'm actually kind of, of shocked at everything the comptroller has done this year and just how it's moving in a much different direction than things have trended before. Like, <laughs> Does the anti-discrimination cover journalists who expose war crimes of the U.S. government? Um, yeah, it, it would cover anybody. Like, that's the point. Like, they, they're pretty much going, like, you are not allowed to just refuse to deal with a whole segment of the market because you don't want to deal with it. You go individual by individual, and if they are not too high of a risk, then price the service and give it to them. And so, like, if, you know, like I said, if if you look at all the examples, it's all big corporate institutions but if this were to happen, um, that kind of still opens the door um, for, you know, little guys to make the argument and go, hey, um, this should be covered under this too. You know what I mean? Well, I guess we'll see when the next banking blockade comes. That's how we'll know whether it truly works. Mm hmm. And just when you think shit couldn't get weirder. It did. What did? 
So Circle um, has partnered with the U.S. government, um, the president in exile, John um, Guido, I hope I said that right, of Venezuela, and a U.S.-based fintech company, AirTM, um, to use USDC to distribute aid to Venezuela in partnership with, with the, uh, air quote, um, illegitimate um, government in exile. And, um, yeah, so it, it's pretty much become impossible to deliver aid down there because any bank wiring um, is being blocked and seized frequently by the Maduro regime. Um, also, anything wired in conventionally is forced into um, kind of the utter delusional um, disconnected from reality exchange rate to the Bolivar um, and not the actual price in the market. Um, and it's been fucking with things like that. So um, effectively, um, what's going on here is when the US government seizes money um, that is Maduro's under the, the sanctions that have been put on them, um, they effectively are handing it over um, to the government in exile, who is going to circle and minting USDC. And then that is taken and deposited at this air ATM or air TM, um, like FinTech app and can either be spent directly in the app, um, hooked up to a virtual debit card. Um, and most importantly wired, um, to your bank, which if that succeeds, um, is done with the actual market exchange rate and not the bullshit government one. Um, and is also done, I, I'm assuming, in, in a much less obvious looking way, um, flowing through financial wires. So probably a lot more difficult for the Maduro regime to clamp down on every single person selling USDC through this into bolivars. Um, so yeah, um, this is really weird and honestly um <laughs> looking at the fact that this is going on i am completely rethinking my entire attitude about how many governments in the world might actually start thinking about more open access systems in terms of a, a digital currency um knowing that that would flow a little out of their control and the rest of the world just to get the economic um, monetary policy benefits out of that. Um, because if, if you had, if you had showed me this story last year, I would have laughed in your face and gone, you're crazy. Um, that, that would never happen. Um, it just did like all, all these stable coins that, you know, regulators have had their eyes on for quite a while. We're just literally throwing them out there into the world as a dollar equivalent. Like the, the government is literally stamping off an approval on that. That's kind of fucking crazy. Yikes. You know, and maybe we actually will see real crypto in terms of central bank digital currency over the next decade or so, and not just database memes, um, <laughs> if this kind of stuff keeps happening. I think there will be plenty of database memes. Oh, that for sure. But I'm, I'm interested in seeing um, who has the balls to actually go past that and how that plays out if somebody does. Yeah. So what happens when you slap a journalist in the face for potentially lying? Well, back in Block Digest episode 242, as I s attempted to say earlier at the wrong time, Shinobi went over the Forbes article that was published at the end of October alleging that Binance had conspired to evade U.S. regulators. Uh, and at the time, the CEO of Binance replied that this was false and that Binance was engaged and partnered with many of the industry's top AML uh, CFT tools and vendors, including CypherTrace, Elliptic, Refinitiv, 
Jumio, who I've never heard of, now I have to look it up and more, uh, to uphold high regulatory standards, and we will continue to do, to do so. Um, I should also point out that Refinitiv is jointly, it's the jointly owned company that does World Check, which uh, I would not consider to be a top quality product. But anyway, on November 18th, Binance Holdings Limited, which is uh, being represented by Peter Pizzi and Charles Harder, who also had represented Hulk Hogan in the notorious Gawker case, has filed a defamation lawsuit against Michael and Jason and Forbes, uh, which is the media outlet they work for and where this story was. Uh, And so in the lawsuit, they say the story contains numerous false, misleading, and defamatory statements about Binance. Among other things, the story falsely states that Binance created an elaborate scheme to evade Bitcoin regulators conceived of an elaborate corporate structure designed to intentionally deceive regulators, had an ulterior motive in setting up a U.S. entity, sought to execute a bait-and-switch, sought to surreptitiously profit from crypto investors in the United States, funneled back revenue from its U.S. entity to its parent company, used its U.S. entity as a decoy, sought to undermine the ability of anti-money laundering and U.S. sanctions enforcement to detect illicit activity, is reminiscent of... Amway style multi level marketing organizations has been sidestepping American regulators, exhibits a key red flag characteristic of money laundering, and that there is speculation that the FBI and the IRS may be investigating Binance. That is a long list of things. And so they describe these statements as highly damaging, and they further claim that neither Binance nor anyone on its behalf created the purported 2018 slideshow presentation that was referenced in the story. The person who Forbes claims created it, Harry Zhao, is not and never has been an employee of Binance. Binance uh, has not implemented any of the suggestions in the proposal, which was created by a third party. And as compensation, they request compensatory damages, punitive damages, permanent injunctive relief to prevent the defendants from... uh, uh, to remove and then never repeat the defamatory statements, and also all costs of the lawsuit. Um, none of which have any suggested amount attached. It just says that the amount would be determined at trial. Uh, so, yeah, I guess uh, I guess we've got our own uh, Gawker 2.0 happening here. Well, I do have to say that not quantifying the damages was probably a smart move because doing that and getting that wrong from the judge's point of view um, would probably um, make this look very bad. I'm mostly just interested in seeing if they can actually establish with proof um, that this document was not produced internally and they did absolutely nothing um, to actually enact this. Yeah, well, at least uh, we don't got any, you know, weird revealing videos in this case. Hopefully, please do not, please do not make that (laughs) become a thing. I can't say it. Because we'll get banned. I don't want to see any unsafe content. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Ready for a really, 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 really short story that was literally shorter than that? Mine will probably Electrum be release. shorter than yours. New Electrum release. Lightning enabled by default. That's it. Damn it. Well, mine is also sort of short. Um, Since June, the uh, hardware wallet company Ledger has been developing a lightweight bridge for connecting Ledger Live to a Bitcoin core fall node called Ledger Sat Stack. And they say it's designed to allow Ledger Live users um, to use Bitcoin without compromising on privacy or relying on Ledger's infrastructure. And at the moment, it's still in alpha version 0.0. 9.0, which is the latest release as of six days ago. So if you're a Ledger user and you don't want to be sharing any more wallet information with Ledger whatsoever, then this should help you migrate to using your own node instead. So that's good. Woo! woo. It's actually kind of funny to me that um, the hardware wallet that is literally running on a hundred percent closed sourced shit and not some intelligent like combination of open source and closed um 
is is the wallet to do this first i think th this is like the first actual applet that comes with a hardware device that can plug and play with a node right is this the first what sorry i didn't catch that like this is the first hardware wallet manufacturer that made their app compatible with a core instance right um no i don't think so because i think trezor you can also do that they just haven't published they haven't publicized it as much but i think you can also do that with trezor well maybe they should publicize it a little more um what the fuck i remember them mentioning it when um when they uh when the tour the tour update came a uh, week a few weeks ago or something when they uh they uh, enabled onion location and stuff like that and made it so that you could really easily use the Trezor app, uh, the Trezor suite with Tor. They, someone also mentioned using a node and they replied saying you could do that already. So it is possible. They just haven't really pushed it. Push it harder. Like, what the fuck? Alrighty. Shinobi needs to take a quick 10 second sprint to fill his glass of water. Yeah, so that that is what it is. Block block book. That's what I heard of when they um, commented. So yeah, it is a thing, Shinobi. <laughs> Agua. I see. Alrighty, are we ready for an interesting um, proposal from Rusty Russell? Sure. So he has proposed. A um, new um, invoice flow for how you handle payments over Lightning Network. Um, I'm going to try and keep it as high level as I can. But um, so pretty much um, how things work now, you generate an invoice, um, spit that out, and somebody can pay with that. So that's part of the... Um, bolt 11 um, in the lightning spec. Um, this proposed bolt 12 would remove um, the invoice as the standard way of dealing with things um, potentially and replace it with an offer, um, which would just be an advertisement for a node. And the entire structure of invoices, um, this offer, and what is a new construct called a invoice request, um, rather than kind of hashing things and formatting things, and then ultimately signing it with a node um, identity key all in one go, um, it's pretty much a Merkle tree structure with some fake nodes in it um, modeled after Taproot, um, and the signature is applied to the hash. Um, at the top of that Merkle tree. And so this way, um, you can selectively reveal um, subparts of an invoice without having to reveal the whole thing to prove that it's legitimate. And there's also a few new um, things such as a, um, a new ephemeral key used um, as a proof of payment instead of the, the pre-image of a payment itself. Um, but effectively, the structure here would be my Lightning node posts an offer. And these can be much more um, like long-lived in terms of time expiries than an actual invoice. Um, and you would take this offer um, data structure, um, verify it, and then over the Lightning network, um, construct a invoice request with all of the details filled in in terms of amounts um, things like that and then the node that receives that would then over the lightning network actually send you um, the full invoice to pay and then the payment would be routed and completed and in this process the invoice request um, would have a new public key attached to it um, and that could function as a proof to that node in the future that you are the entity um, that actually initiated the invoice request and, and probably paid it in the first place. 
Um, so pretty much just in the invoice structure and how this has been reordered, um, you get something that um, payment points would give you that hash locks couldn't, which is a unique proof of payment that only the person who initiated the payment has. But with a hash pre-image, um, everybody who participated in routing that payment um, gets the pre-image at the end. So that's not unique enough to, to go back to the node you paid in the future and prove, hey, I'm the guy that paid you in case you needed something like a, a refund. And the really interesting part is a structure of using these um, for recurring payments. So all of these um, data structures now have um, fields in them in order to handle um, recurring payments. And so the, the whole idea here is that using um, the offer to kind of initiate all of this, um, you can negotiate um, with the node um, like a, a monthly bill for something, um, a daily payment for something, or even take it down to um, seconds. But effectively, um, you would have a, a, a set for a, a whole um, set of recurring payments kind of negotiated where um, the interval of payment is established. So like a yearly thing, a monthly thing, um, a multi-day thing, and then um, a payment interval. So how often you want to have that payment um, recurring. And then from this point, um, there is recurrence windows. Um, so pretty much, um, let's say you want to accept next month's payment um, with a margin of error. So you could specify, um, you know, 12 hours before um, this month's subscription is going to expire, um, he can pay early. Um, after that, um, you know, the other side of that, like, let's say you forget to renew your subscription um, 12 hours after the previous one expired. Um, it will still accept that as a valid payment and renew the subscription. And the key is that because of these time intervals, um, that node who you're paying um, knows when to or not accept a series in, in this payment. Like, let's say I start uh, a subscription with you, I open up the first month of service and make the payment, um, it's not going to let me two days into that month um, pay the month after that. The node would reject and not confirm that payment. So it would time out and fail. Um, and so like the, the whole um, core of, of this bolt to me seems heavily geared around kind of these recurring payment type things. And I really think it's just the general structure changes um, of how invoicing is handled, I think, could be a, an improvement just for regular payments, potentially. But it, it's really nice to see an invoicing structure and the logic of how to pay subscriptions over Lightning um, worked out like this. Like just the considering the fact, um, you know, when this month is up, um, do I have to like sit there at 12 midnight at exactly the dot and click the button at the right time to not have my subscription lockout? Um, the, the 12 hour window on both sides, I could do that 12 hours early. I could do that 12 hours late. Um, the payment is still honored and the subscription isn't cut off. And so it, it's really nice to see this. And yeah, I mean, it, it's really, I think, a lot of stuff like this that has nothing to do with the, the transaction structure on chain or how an old channel state is voided are, are going to get built out over time to kind of deal with weird use case issues like that. And I really think over time, like that aspect of the overall lightning protocol is probably going to get just as flexible as the way of structuring transactions is going to be. Yeah. So Woot 
kicking ass, Rusty. Keep kicking ass. So what is up next that happened this week? Is it my turn now? CC. Well, as uh, many of you may have seen, uh, actress Maisie Williams tweeted a poll saying, "Should oh, should I go along Bitcoin on Bitcoin? Yes or no?" Um, and the end result uh, was forty six percent yes and fifty three percent no. Uh, but then she did a reply and said, thank you for the advice. I bought some anyway with a kind of like, uh, you know, side glance Shrek meme image. So yeah, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, Maisie Williams is the actress who plays Arya Stark in uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, badass uh, follower Makulas <laughs> and all that. Uh, and yes, all men must defy. Yeah, that was especially hilarious to me. Like, I, I'm almost positive she'd already bought Bitcoin when she made that first tweet. She she just wanted to, like, put that across to her followers. You know what I mean? Yeah, it is interesting who this stuff is reaching. Like it's it's weird that like I'm I mean I don't know has anyone heard whether like Keanu Reeves has bought Bitcoin like I would have expected Keanu Reeves to come first ahead of Arya Stark but who knows Whoa Yeah the fuck because I actually who I don't know if it was you that I told but like I've seen I've seen that meme for so many years and I didn't find out that that was Keanu Reeves until I think several months ago. <laughs> it's literally the movie that launched his career that he is yeah. known for. I still haven't seen it so I didn't know that. And then I looked cuz I looked at it and he looks it, he looks very similar to someone else that I know, so I always saw that person's face, and it just it didn't look like Keanu Reeves enough for me to think it was him. Hey, daughters, how are you doing? Uh, I don't know, we're just dead and, you know, in hell. Yeah, but how are you doing? Sounds about right. Oh, man. Okay, so this this one, just short and sweet, but, um... The, uh, you know, somebody from BlackRock, um, kind of publicly said that they could see Bitcoin mostly replacing gold, something, something gold is unwieldy, um, you know, can't just pass gold bars around like Bitcoin, something, something, um, and he, he did kind of preface that most accounts, um, they're managing are not really touching Bitcoin a lot, but um, that is literally the biggest asset manager on the entire planet. So, yeah, if Michael Saylor or winds up um, effectively turning MicroStrategy into a company with a chain analytics subdivision. What do you think the negative side of something like BlackRock finally putting their foot in the pond is going to be? Something to mull over instead of just seeing BlackRock and then immediately getting a hard on. Because you know what? There's two sides to all these coins. Yep. It's like pulling a Band-Aid, I guess. Let's, let's, let's get through this last, uh, last story. And end on the depressing note. Yeah, so uh, in case you haven't heard, um, the deadline for the U.S. prosecution in Julian Assange's extradition case in the U.K. Uh, passed recently where they had to submit their closing statements. And I don't know if this has changed, but I'm pretty sure the defense now gets a few days to then kind of respond to the closing statements by the prosecution or to update their own statements and then that's it and basically we're all just waiting until January 4th or some t day around then to uh, get the uh, decision by 
the judge on whether she will accept or reject the extradition request. Um, but the scarier thing that happened in the last couple of days is that there's been reports that um, there's been a coronavirus outbreak in Belmarsh Prison, which is where Julian Assange is being held. And even weirder, um, according to various people on Twitter, I haven't seen an article on this yet, but um, Christine Assange, which is his mother, um, says that for some reason positive cases, I don't know if this is just because there are positive cases popping up in his wing, or as she says, she's saying all positive cases are sent to Julian's wing, as in they're being moved there in order to, I guess, maybe like that's where they decided to try and contain it. Um, but as we've known for a number of years, um, at least I think, sin I don't know which doctor evaluated him for this, but he's had a lung condition for a while in addition to various other things that have not been treated as a result of him not being allowed to see any kind of, you know, professional medical staff who could address it in the Ecuadorian embassy and then in Belmarsh prison um, for a number of years. So he not only has a chronic lung condition, but a bunch of other things. And so it's really not good to hear that positive coronavirus cases might be, you know, in his vicinity. Um, the risk might not be as high as it would be under normal circumstances because apparently like i said this i think the outbreak is beyond his wing so basically the prison has kind of gone into lockdown and they're not allowed to interact with other prisoners that's when i what i heard when i first heard about this so he's not he's not being allowed to interact with other prisoners and that has its own problems but um if there is any kind of effective isolation whatsoever uh, which I doubt, um, because uh, if anyone knows anything about prisons, it's that it's one of the places that is the hardest to literally contain anything, because anything and everything seems to be able to get into and out of prisons somehow. Um, this is not a good sign, and this is why people keep saying it makes no sense to be holding someone in a maximum security prison and for the most violent criminals and terrorists in the UK when he could have just been released on bail as a nonviolent person who has not been convicted is on remand for nonviolent offenses. Um, it makes no sense to have him in a maximum security prison when he is someone who is at high risk of, you know, suffering the worst consequences if he catches coronavirus. So that should happen. Like, hey, you know, give everyone a holiday break, including him, because he doesn't deserve to be in there. But I don't know if that's going to happen because the UK is a hellhole, and I feel bad for anyone who lives there because not only is freedom of the press a joke, um, you don't really want to be in the UK right now <laughs> with uh, how they're handling the situation. So this is really disturbing. Well, do we have any pick me up positive final thoughts to cap on the end here? Um, well, I saw an article a few days ago about how Telegram is a piece of shit app, it, although it's written in German. Um, it's a uh, there's one word that translates well from German to English, catastrophe. Uh, so, <laughs> yes, there. I don't know if that's a pick me up though. I think everyone knows that Telegram is a catastrophe. All right. I'll take us out on some snark then. Um, apparently, um, just because um, there is a decent chance that Donald Trump has lost this election this year, um, all of the evidence of voter manipulation and fraud in the United States that goes back like 20 plus years to before George eight or W Bush was fucking elected, um, is magically not evidence anymore. Rest assured, Janine, our voting process is the most secure, full of integrity process in the entire world. All right. Well, I don't know if that was a pick me up, but I actually did just think of one, which is that 
Oh my God, Jeremy uh, Hammond, who has uh, he, he was imprisoned um, as a result of being convicted for the Strat Four hack. Um, he has been released from FCI Memphis, and he's now in a halfway house in Chicago, which is, I believe, where he originally lived and was arrested from. So Jeremy Hammond is free. That is good news. That's my boy. All right. On that note, folks, we will catch you later, punks. Adios. Bye. Yeah, <laughs> you